Uh, welcome to this session. Um, uh, so this is uh, session number FT10, Topological Mechanisms in Physics from Star to Electron. My name is Luca Giomi, I'll be the chair of this session. This session is sponsored by DEEP, the Dutch Institute of, for Emergent Phenomena. And the main focus is about topology. So topology has always been an important part of the lexicon of theoretical physics. Uh, recently, there has been a burst of interesting results which are related with the use of topology in physics, both as a way to interpret uh, phenomena and a way to somehow rationalize physical mechanisms. And so we wanted to organize an overview about uh, topology in physics from different point of views. And therefore we collected, we gathered together uh, four excellent researchers <clears throat> working in different areas of physics from particle to uh, soft condensed matter, from classical to quantum and so on. So the first talk will be given by Christiane Moraes Smith from Utrecht University. And uh, the talk is 20 minutes and then there will be some time for question. If you have question, please use the chat and, uh, and or raise your hand. At the end, uh, I will give you, I will give you uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, the stage is yours, Christiane. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for putting this session together. It's a pleasure to join you today, although I have COVID and somehow my PowerPoint is not working properly. So you will miss my nice movies that I had prepared for you, but I try to go through the slides nevertheless in that way. So today we start by telling you about topology involving electrons and how to engineer topological states of matter atom by atom in an artificial manner. So everything came from Feynman when more than 60 years ago, he gave a talk telling us that there, there is plenty of room at the bottom and inviting us to generate matter in a bottom-up approach and to construct matter in a way and with the functionalities that we are interested in. It took very long for these ideas to flourish. It started like 20 years ago in the field of cold atoms in optical lattices and later on in photonics. And only very recently, it started going on with electrons. So the question we address here is how to build quantum simulators with electrons and how to build topological states of matter. So we are going to use four ingredients for our quantum simulator. The first one is a metal like copper because above a certain energy, the electrons on the surface, they form an electron liquid, okay? And then we are going to use a scanning tunneling microscope to pattern atoms on top to generate the lattices that we are interested in. And the kind of adsorbates that we are going to use are carbon monoxide, hundreds of them. And then they will be patterned with the help of the tip of the microscope and we will build several kinds of lattices. So usually, you know, the scanning tunneling microscope in two kinds of functions. One, when you scan with the tip on top of the sample on a, cons a constant current mode, and then you can see the topography of your sample or if you change the current by tuning the voltage and the GIGV versus voltage tells you about the local density of states. And the local density of states is measuring the modulus of the wave function square. So that's uh, uh, the things that we usually use on STM4. But here you can see my animation, but we are going to approach this tip pretty much to these uh, atoms which are on the substrate, and we are going to move them around while uh, building the setup. So this work is inspired by a work done in the group of Don Eigler at IBM in 1993. You see here on your left, the first so-called quantum corral. These are iron atoms which have been arranged in a circle. The separation between these two red spikes is one nanometer. And these beautiful blue waves that you see inside are electronic waves. This is the electron wave function, which is forming a wave in a quantum corral, as you see at the C 
when you have the reefs, right? They did then this beautiful movie, which is playing on the right, which is the smallest video ever made. Each of these white spikes is one ad atom, and the separation between them is nanometer. So it's called the boy and his atom. You can see it in, uh, in the internet, in YouTube. So they built this first uh, corral. In this first corral, you can solve the Schrodinger equation in a circular box as you're doing a first year uh, quantum mechanics. And you are going to get these three black and white figures here, depending on the number of nodes you have. And if you compare with the top figure with the local density of states that you measure with the GIGV versus voltage, you see that you can already understand this very well. So the next step was then to build a lattice. So you go from one quantum corral to two coupled quantum corrals. And first thing you observe is that if you go from A to B here and you build your corral slightly bigger, you push the energy down. If you go to higher energies as in C, you can probe also P orbitals, which have a node in the center. And now you put these two corals together by, by patterning the confinement. So you are patterning the black spots around and you are defining the electronic sites which are drawn in blue. And if you close these two a bit further, the door between the two, or if you do an open door like in E, you are separating the hopping further so you separate the energy level. So you can control quite a lot. And now you go from two into many. And that's what was done in the group of Hari Manohar. And he took all these many uh, little COs which are here in brown on top of the yellow. And he patterned them in a triangular lattice. And then he could build here the artificial graphene that you see where this bar here is two nanometers. It's 10 times larger than real graphene. And if you do the GIGV, you see this V shape here in green, which is the top part of your Duracon. So when we entered this field, that's where the field was. And we decided to, first of all, pattern lattices, which had different geometries, like a square lattice that you see here on the right. This is a lib lattice. Then we have shown how to design different orbitals at different lattice sites in real space. You put Px and Py in one side, Px in one, only Py in the other by design. Then we have been breaking symmetries to be able to lift the energy of Px and Py also in the energy uh, landscape. After that, we have been building the first quantum fractal. We built a fractal here and we could show that the electronic wave function was living in dimension 1.58. But today I am going to tell you about these two works that are here. So Ahoti in a Kagome lattice, how to control the topology and the edges in a Kekule lattice, how the edges are important when you have this type of topological crystalline insulators. Okay, so the theoretical descriptions that we use, these are single particle systems. The first one is the so-called muffin tin model. This is a tin to bake muffin that you invert. And now you have the surface electrons which are moving in between these mountains. So these mountains are the carbon monoxide. Electrons are moving in between. We know their effective mass. We know their diameter. You basically solve, this, solve the Schrodinger equation for this finite size geometry. And then we do a tight binding description on which we compare the energy levels to find the tight binding parameters. Okay, so let's start. First of all, how to generate what is called a higher order topological insulator. And here I would like to call the attention to Sander Kempkes, who was my PhD student and did most of the calculations for this work, Iete van den Broeke, and Marlouis Lott, who did the experiments. It was published in 2019 in Nature Materials, and we have a recent archive that's now in print in Pier B, where we discuss in more details the analysis of this material. Okay, so first of all, what is a topological insulator? A topological insulator is a material that is insulating the bulk and conducting at the edges. 
So you have the, the bulk bands that are not appearing here in my figure. And you, if you have propagating modes, your E versus K will have these modes inside the bulk gap. And you have another kind, which is called the higher order topological insulators, where your edge modes have dimension D minus two, at least. So if you are in two dimensions, instead of having a one dimensional edge mode propagating at the boundaries, you have corners which have zero energy. So we are going to use the nomenclature HOTI here in a very loose manner. It's not the same HOTI as was originally proposed by Ben Alcazar. It's simply that you have rather protect zero energy modes at the corner of your sample. So there was a prediction by the group of Ezawa that if you would take a Kagome lattice, a Kagome lattice has these inverted triangles looking down and triangles looking up. And now you, you build the breathing Kagome lattice where you have the red bonds, which can be, which are called the TAs and can be smaller or larger than the TBs and the blue bonds, which have a different intensity. And if the TA is smaller than the TB, you are going to have a topological phase. And if the, the TB is zero, you are going to form trimers here. This state is going to be a trivial state. So to get a topological, you need to have one isolated zero mode at the corners of your trion. And we went into designing this breathing Kagome lattice in the nanometer scale. You can see here the design, the black spots are, the black dots are the COs that we are patterning. The blue, the yellow and the green dots is where the electrons are going to sit. We paint them with different colors because the green stands for the bulk, the yellow for the edge and the blue for the corner. And these red little dashed lines you see here is because this hopping is going to be weak from the yellow to the blue. You see that the black dots are pointing towards that. So they are making a very weak door for the electrons to go through. That's why you have a weak hopping, okay? And where you see the blue hopping, the blue lines, thick lines, you see that here hopping is strong because there is just one black dot there confining the hopping between the two yellow sides. So the black dots are then the design that we do in the nanometer scale, the underlying triangular lattice is the, the copper lattice. And then you build two types of lattices, a trivial one and a topological one. And now, so here you see the design of the, the non-trivial and the trivial ones. And now you look at the bands here down on the left, and you see it with the STM tip at the green, the yellow and the blue sides. And you will get for the trivial case, each curve goes on the right down here. Each curve goes on top of each other if you are at the edge corner or bulk. But if you are in the non-trivial configuration, you see that the green has two little mountains with a dip in the middle. And precisely at the, the middle point, the blue has a higher value there and this is your zero mode actually and you can now sit at this energy and scan your entire sample and here you see the experiment on the left and on the right so the non-trivial on the left the trivial on the right and in the middle you see the theoretical calculations depending on energy on the energy your intensity is in the bulk here in red on the left at the edge or at the corner you see the three red corners at 50 mav and in the trivial case it's everywhere the same we can now design some defects into the latches. And by putting defects here, you destroy one of your corner modes, the other two remain robust. But depending on the time, you can design a 60 degrees angle and then you design a new zero mode on the bottom right left, uh, right uh, image. So, that was then for the Hati. In my remaining five minutes, I would like to tell you now about a different type of system, which is now a topological crystalline insulator. We know from topological insulators that the only thing that determines the edge modes is the topology. 
So if you have a quantum hole sample or a quantum spin hole sample, where your topology is driven by the spin orbit coupling or by the magnetic field for the quantum hall, determination of your sample is not important at all. You will always have your edge modes, which are driven by magnetic field or by the spin orbit coupling. But this is not the case for the topological crystalline insulators. And the reason for that is that now determination of your sample defines your unit cell. And depending on the unit cell, you have a topological or a trivial state. So we wanted to verify this statement because this is very special. And that's what we did in this work. And I would like to call the attention to Yete, who did all the calculations, and Sarsha, who did all the measurements. So in this case, we are taking a Kekule lattice. This is a honeycomb like the graphene lattice, but now you will have different hoppings. Inside the hexagon, you have T0, which is here in red. In connecting hexagons, you have a hopping T1, which is a different value. And there was then different kinds of edges that we investigate, what we call a molecular zigzag on the left, a partially bearded on the right, and the armchair, but I will not show you the armchair. The armchair one is gapped. And we have these special ones to make sure that you don't favor one type of sublattice in the honeycomb at the termination. You should have the same types, uh, the same number of A and B sublattices. So there was this prediction by the group of Professor Hu that depending on whether T1 or T0 are large, and depending on the termination, so if you would have the molecular zigzag, and T1 is larger than T0, so this one is topological, and for T1 is smaller than T0, it's trivial. But now, the same bulk, if you have the partially bearded, it inverts. Now, for T1 larger than T0, it becomes trivial, and the other one becomes topological. So that's quite funny that for the same bulk, with one termination, you have a topological state, and with the other termination, you have a trivial one. And now you invert the types, the, the, the relative weight between T1 and T0, and you invert who is topological. So we wanted to check that. And for this, that is our experimental realization. So we built four lattices. It is a state of the art with the amount of COs that were manipulated. And this is the partially bearded, and the right one is the molecular zigzag. All the blacks are the COs. The additional red ones we have here you need to really block the sample to see the edge states without adding additional on-site potentials. So you have to really do very precise calculations before building to make sure that you are not deforming your lattice. And we built these four lattices and here you can see. If T1 is smaller than T0, so you have these very thick hexagons weakly connected. And you see here that for the molecular zigzag edge, Everything is trivial, one curve, no matter where you sit in the bulk or at different positions at the edge in yellow, green, or blue, you, everything is the same. But if you have a partially bearded, you see that the red has a maximum where the black, which is the bulk, has a minimum. And the violet also has a maximum. This is a topological state. So now you sit at this topological state and here you are, you can image your edge mode in white. And on the top, you see the, the measurements at the bottom, the calculations. You do the now T0 is smaller than the T1, and you have the opposite. Now, the partially bearded is trivial, and the second one is topological. You see that the yellow and the blue are topological. You see that the energy of the topological, and you see here in white, you can visualize your topological state. So I come to my conclusions. We have been building several kinds of lattices. I told you just one of them, like the lib lattice that I didn't show, but I have shown you the topological states that we have been building and designing. One of them is how to generate zero modes in a Kagome lattice, that is a breathing Kagome lattice. And at certain energies, you have zero modes, which are rather robust at the edges, at the corners, 
And then I have shown you if you have a honeycomb lattice like graphene, but now with a different hoppings, T0 and T1, that depending on the termination of your sample, you are going to have topological states like the white one shown here on the left. I would then like to thank my collaborators, in special Ingmar Svart, who is the STM specialist doing the experiments in Utrecht, and Danielle von Mackelberg, Marie-Louise Lott, who did most of the experiments, and Sarsha, who did the one I have just shown you, Sander Kempkes and Dieter van den Broek, who are my PhD students doing the calculations and predicting everything before we give the design to the experimentalists. So with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christiane. Thank you. It, uh, I think the, the excellent physics really compensated for the technical uh, hurdles. Um, we have uh, four minutes to ask questions, so I will ask the audience uh, <clears throat> to prepare the questions. In the meantime, I will abuse my role of chair to ask the first one. Um, so uh, maybe I, mean, I, I come from a different field and perhaps I miss what you said, but um, do you have anything interesting to say about the penetration depth of these topological modes? And uh, anything insightful to say about dissipation? I mean, what, what takes to drive the systems? How long will they last? Yes. So you see, STM is a static probe. So uh, you were, they are there for very long. Mm. What you are seeing here, we are detecting the modulus of psi square, right? So what we are detecting here, when you look at this image, for instance, you are seeing that there is a much higher probability to see your electrons at the edge. Mm -hmm. So that's what you can measure. We cannot measure currents. You cannot measure transport. There are some people, I have a colleague in China who has the same setup with which he does an STM. He can also measure transport, which would be fantastic to do this kind of things, to measure uh, these modes here, right? So everything what I'm showing you is static. It's there for long. And it's just, uh, I am just probing the higher probability. White means you have a higher probability to be there. And this is simply because when you look here, you see uh, at the yellow positions and the blue positions, you have a dip. So this is the gap in the black and in the green, and you have a high probability to be at the edge. So when I sit at this specific energy, my modes are at the edge. So these are my edge modes. Does this answer your question? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. So we have a question go. from uh, Tis Janssen. Uh, maybe I will read it, right? Uh, so uh, do you need some kind of spin orbit coupling in these artificial lattices to get the topological states? And then there is also a remark. Very nice images, by the way. Thank you very much. No, we don't need any spin orbit coupling. So you can generate topological states in different ways. You can generate with a magnetic field perpendicular to it, and then you get a quantum hole. These are chiral modes, right? You can generate by having a spin orbit coupling. These are helical modes. You have spin up and spin down counter propagating because intrinsic spin orbit coupling is like plus magnetic field for spin up and minus magnetic field for spin down. So the kind of states I am generating, it's just by getting a breathing lattice, like in the SSH chain, where you have A and B sites because you have hoppings T A and T B, you have a breathing mode, okay? So now what happens is that you are going to have zero modes if your extremal uh, uh, bond is a weak, is, is a T A that's smaller than T B. So what I'm building here in two dimensions is analogous to that. I am building lattices which have hoppings T A and T B, and this type of top topological insulators belong to the class, which are the topological crystalline insulators. Is the, the, the lattice geometry that is generating that. There is no spin orbit coupling. And that's the reason why now the termination matters to get a topological state or not. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, we are in perfect timing. So I would say we uh, move ahead, we move on with the next speaker. Uh, please uh, share your screen. 
Uh, so the next uh, speaker is going to be uh, Elisabetta Pallante from the University of Groningen, and we are going to move on high energy physics. Please go ahead, Elisabetta. Yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, I thought I had my slides open. One moment. Okay, I'm already sharing. Uh, not that I can see. Not, not yet, sorry. Yes, no. Who can share? Yes, perfect. Now. Okay. Okay, I think you can see it, also the pointer. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, now, as, uh, as Luca was saying, uh, we are indeed moving to particle physics, so a little bit of a different context, uh, especially in terms of the number of dimensions. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, uh, we are working in four dimensions. We move to four space-time dimensions where particle physics mostly lives. And it will therefore become pretty much harder to visualize things. In fact, this picture is not in four, but in three dimensions. Um, and I will admittedly use quite some uh, formulas, but still the aim uh, is the one of, uh, of uh, let you concentrate on, uh, uh, on a few relevant concepts, uh, hopefully. Now, I will actually tell you a story, a short story. Oh. Now, strangely enough, it's not working. Uh, oh, that, 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 that happens when, when you click on the slides. If you try to click again. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Now it works. Yeah. So I will tell you a short story. And uh, the story started relatively long ago, let's say uh, between the 70s and the 90s, but is not yet complete. Uh, actually, it's far from being complete. And this is one of the open questions. Uh, in the standard model, well, really, we need uh, uh, some few theoretical steps uh, in order to complete the story. Now, the protagonist in this story is FF tilde, where F uh, is the field strength tensor and F tilde is its dual. And what makes uh, the story here is the relation, the connection between topology and anomalies. Here, topology comes. Now, in this specific example, uh, F of tilde is a local function of space-time, therefore is a genuine short distance effect, and it appears as an anomaly known as the abelian chiral anomaly. On the other hand, its integral overall for space-time is a topological entity. Why? For example, the fact that it doesn't depend on the metric tensor. Now, the relation between topology and anomalies, I would say that is this precisely the place where topology is able to give us physical implications within particle physics. Uh, topology is definitely not ubiquitous when it comes to predictions in particle physics, uh, but this is a very uh, interesting intriguing place uh, where it makes uh, uh, its appearance. Now, our theory is Young-Mills theory uh, in a four uh, dimensional Euclidean space-time uh, with the addition of massless Dirac fermions. And I take uh, NF copies of these Dirac fermions, also so-called flavors. Um, and if you take uh, NF equal three and you add a little bit of mass to the fermions, uh, then you get uh, the word QCD. Uh, now, F is very well known, uh, the property, the distinctive property of this theory, the fact that the gauge uh, degrees of freedom, uh, the gluons uh, self uh, interact. And this has, of course, many consequences, but the most uh, uh, known and the most difficult theoretically is confinement. On the other hand, uh, FF tilde is not uh, in the Lagrangian, uh, not yet. And we will see how it will uh, appear. Now, in this sketchy phase diagram, uh, where I have on the vertical axis, I have the temperature, and on the horizontal axis, I have the number of Dirac fermions. 
We will be concentrating on the low temperature, low fermion number region, the green region, and here we will try to discover relations between topology and anomalies. Then, of course, we may also wonder what happens when we raise the temperature or what happens when we, sorry, when we um, instead raise the number of fermions and we enter what is known as the conformal window, where really the role of conformal symmetry becomes uh, much more prominent. Sorry. Uh, then let's concentrate now on the classical case without fermions, so classical young males. And now we are interested actually in looking at gauge field configurations where the uh, action that have a finite Euclidean action. Now, when this happens, this requires, of course, that f mu nu vanishes at infinity. However, this doesn't imply per se that the gauge field itself vanishes at infinity. In fact, it does not. Due to the gauge properties of the theory, the gauge field instead is a gauge transform of zero at infinity, which is a non-trivial object depending on the function on u of x, which is the gauge transformation function. And now the natural gauge group enters in the game. The gauge group uh, that we are treating here is SUN. And actually, U of X is the mapping from Euclidean space time, which we take as the hypersphere S3, onto the gauge group SUN. But now we have beautiful theorems in Lie groups, on simple Lie groups, that tell us that what is relevant is not SUN, but any subgroup SU2 of SUN. And SU2, in turn, is topologically equivalent to S3. Therefore, the mapping we are interested in is simply the hypersphere S3 onto itself. Now, a mathematician would say that every finite action field configuration belongs to a homotopy class of mappings. And each homotopy class is, um, uh, is let's say, is car carries a degree a degree that is actually a number called known as the winding number. And actually it turns out that this number is an integer that can be positive, negative, or zero. Why? Because the, topo the homotopy group in this case is by three over three, which is the group of integers. Now the winding number, what it does, uh, it simply measures uh, the, the, how many times uh, the hypersphere is wrapped around itself. Uh, is also known as the Puntryagin or the chen Puntryagin index. And now it turns out that you have a representation as a volume integral of this object. And here comes our protagonist, FF tilde, um, in, in terms as the integrand of the, of, the volume, of the volume integral. Notice that there is a coupling constant, the gauge coupling constant in front. In terms of tilde is also the divergence of the shared simons current. And naively, you would say, well, the integral over all four space time of a total divergence is zero, but this is an exception, as you can see. Actually, it is also, it also admits a surface integral representation, and this is nicely written exclusively in terms of the gauge function u of x. And it's then easier in this case to show that is actually an integer. Now, the interesting thing is that it is valid, as I said, for any SUN. Also, all the little numbers that, that we have in this derivation, they are the same for any SUN with n equal to or greater. Um, on the other hand, we can also visualize the potential, the potential energy as a function of the gauge fields and what is happening here. And we have a sort of periodic potential where we have infinitely many minima and each minimum corresponds to a different value of the winding number. Uh, what we would like to do quantistically, um, what we would like to do quantistically is to visit uh, all possible throws, so all possible winding numbers. And in fact, this is one of the problems that become relevant, uh, for example, when you simulate uh, Lattice, uh, when you simulate uh, gauge theories in four dimensions uh, on a finite box uh, on the lattice. Um, it also suggests that there is a new universal parameter of the quantum theory, which is usually called theta. And uh, this means uh, that our action in principle at the quantum level should be shifted by a term that is known as the theta term. For each given theta, we have uh, a given theory. 
and different values of theta corresponds to distinct theories. And for each given theta, we span over all possible values of the winding number. So this is the first appearance. Now we are taking uh, the quantum theory, quantum young mills, uh, and we add fermions and we quantize fermions. And actually we want to discover properties of fermions uh, on the gauge field background. And now in this case, uh, what we discover is that the measure, the fermionic measure of the path integral is non-invariant under what is called an abelian chiral transformation, which is simply this transformation involving a crucially in four dimension gamma five matrix, the gamma matrix. Now this invariance turns out to be again parameterized in terms of FF tilde. And this known invariance is what is known, well known as the U1 axial anomaly. Quantitatively, the U1 axial anomaly then can also be translated into an equation that tells me how much the corresponding current associated to U1 axial is not conserved. This is the exact formulation in terms of correlation functions of the non-conservation of the axial current in terms of FF tilde. And this is sometimes is the shorthand notation that is often used, but also often we forget about the contact terms. Now, contact terms are simply four dimensional Dirac deltas that uh, often uh, are not, not relevant for the calculation, but sometimes they can actually be uh, quite relevant and give insights into the actual, the, the, the actual prediction. Um, Notice that the, uh, the amount of non-conservation of the current is proportional to the number of fermions and is proportional, therefore is uh, zero if the number of fermions is zero, and is proportional to the gauge coupling square. Now we have discovered that, that this symmetry, the U1 axial symmetry, is anomalous in the sense that it's anomalously broken uh, due to the non-invariance of the fermionic measure. But of course, if it's anomalous, it is not a symmetry. Hence, uh, the U1 particle, the particle that is associated with U1, uh, which is known as the eta prime meson, is not a Goldstone boson because this symmetry cannot be spontaneously broken. This is one version of the uh, solution of the U1 axial problem uh, because it explains, uh, it explains why the mass of the eta prime meson uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this particle does not vanish when all quark masses are zero. So if I give masses to the quarks by X mechanism, um, but then I take the masses to the quarks to zero, then in the chiral limit, the eta prime meson doesn't see this effect and remains actually a relatively heavy particle. Um, now, the, the next question, of course, uh, if you want to be predictive uh, is, can we predict its mass? Uh, and now comes, of course, the difficulty. Uh, we cannot really predict its mass. Uh, why? Also because uh, we didn't solve QCD, we didn't solve young mills, uh, we didn't solve the confinement problem. So this is a non-perturbative uh, uh, question that requires a non-perturbative answer. However, along the years, uh, some uh, uh, very effective approximations uh, uh, are being used. One of them is the Toft 1 over N expansion. Uh, in young mills theories, it's particularly effective because the large and limit is where the theory becomes actually treatable. But in a language that is not the usual one, but is the language of mesons and globals. So what is the large and limit? We take the gauge coupling G to zero and to infinity in such a way that their products here, lambda square, remains fixed. And this gives us a power counting that is particularly effective and actually is tested uh, to work. And it's precisely in this sense, with this large and limit, that the theory in the large and limit becomes the theory of free, a theory of free mesons and globals. The same framework provides also a consistency argument for which we can deduce that actually the mass square of the eta prime is subleading in one over n. It is actually order one over n. Now we come to the maybe surprising conclusion that the mass of the eta prime 
is quite large, so the eta prime is heavy, yet it is suppressed in the large N expansion. It also provides a, a possibly a relation between the mass of the eta prime and some other observables in the theory. Nevertheless, we cannot actually predict. This is a famous relation where we have the mass of the eta prime can be expressed in terms of other parameters and in particular the topological susceptibility. It is very important to look at the limits in which this is taken. This is the zero momentum limit and also the quenched limit. This means when the number of fermions is taken to zero and is only a leading order relation in the large N expansion. Now, what you can hope, of course, is to measure the topological susceptibility of this system on the lattice, but of course you are interested in a corner of the parameter space that is quite difficult to keep under control, which is the zero momentum. Uh, while on the other hand, the quench approximation is an easier, makes uh, your life easier. Now, a full non-perturbative answer, as I said, needs uh, the QCD solution, which actually is the only one that can reconcile the quark gluon picture, while you would like to understand non-perturbatively the correlators, uh, such as the correlator of FF tilde, for any finite N and NF, and uh, on the other hand, the meson global picture. Now, in this context, I would like to uh, mention also some new results uh, together with my collaborators we extracted. And actually, I'm just in the process of submitting to the archive. So I think that by the end of the week, uh, it should be available. And it is, uh, uh, it is uh, somehow we extracted, uh, it is the formulation of a new low energy theorem. Actually, the low energy theorem, this low energy theorem was formulated by my collaborator about two years ago. Uh, and in this work, uh, we are going to provide uh, non perturbative dynamical constraints uh, on the correlators so with a lot of implications for the physics. But what we do and uh, what I always wanted to do is somehow to have such a tool uh, in order to constrain the different phases of the theory starting from the conformal phase, uh, starting from also hypothetical phases uh, where your theory flows uh, from a hypothetical non-trivial fixed point uh, uh, to something else uh, or uh, vice versa. So the, a, a UV to infrared flow that is non-trivial. The, the interesting uh, somehow and uh, maybe unexpected things is that these type of low energy theorems uh, can also provide a rationale, and in fact it does, for the occurrence of contact terms. So, so those mysterious contact terms uh, that I mentioned before and they pop up continuously in our perturbative QCD calculations, actually they must be there. And somehow if the low energy theorem it is, self, that is the self-consistency of the low energy theorem and that actually implies their presence. And as I said, it applies to all phases of Young-Mills theories. So you can, of course, we hope that this can be extended into many directions. Let me also mention that this low energy theorem was also applied um, about two years ago, also uh, in order to uh, be able to explore the compatibility of asymptotic freedom with open closed string duality. And in fact, you can prove uh, in a rather simple way that uh, you have a perturbative uh, compatibility uh, with uh, between asymptotic freedom and open closed string duality in the confining phase, while uh, you have non-perturbative incompatibility of open closed string duality with asymptotic freedom in the confining phase. And so that is an interesting result, but as of course, of course, there are many other applications and in this paper we really explore um, a, a lot of uh, physical implications uh, due to this uh, low energy theorem. Now I, for, I'm, I was missing actually the topological side of the Carroll anomaly in the fermionic context, and let me show that in reality uh, there is also yet another interpretation, topological interpretation, which is now in terms of purely fermionic properties. So the winding number is now instead a fermionic property, a fermionic quantity on the left hand side here. And this is the famous Atiyah Singer index theorem. This is one of those theorems that is quite useful also if you want to uh, numerically solve your theory. And this tells you that, uh, uh, sorry for that. And this tells you that 
the uh, same winding number, the same or central Tiagen index, uh, is also the sign number of zero eigenvalues of the Dirac operator, so a purely fermionic object. Uh, it counts the number of zero modes with chirality plus minus the number of zero modes with chirality minus. Now, this property and other properties of the Dirac mode distribution, for example, the Banks Cash relation, that is probably more for people working in the field, but is also very interesting, and there are many other properties, they provide probes of chiral anomaly on the lattice, for example, but also of spontaneous symmetry breaking of chiral symmetry. So, the moment you want to study phase transitions in four dimensions for gauge field theories, um, by simulating the system in a finite box. And here comes, of course, a lot of subtities. Among them, also the interplay and possibly the no commutativity between the limit in which the mass of the fermions goes to zero and the volume goes to infinity. Uh, finally, uh, of course, as I said, we may wonder what happens uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we raise the temperature or the number of fermions, uh, take into account that topological properties and the anomalies, which are ultraviolet effects, uh, are operatorial relations. Therefore, they are given and they're valid throughout the phase diagram. However, of course, their effect may be suppressed, and we learn the physics from the way they're suppressed. So, for example, if we consider raising the temperature, then at high temperature, the fate of the theory is dictated by asymptotic freedom, but also by dimensional reduction. And effectively, we see that the theory can be described by its reduction, which is QED3. But in three dimension, QED3, of course, has no gamma 5, no chiral anomaly. So this indeed would be in agreement with the fact that we observe, as we do on the lattice, effective restoration of the U1 axial symmetry. In terms of the winding number, this depends that uh, this, this means that there is a suppression of non trivial topological sectors, that means sectors that have a non zero winding number. Um, if we consider, if we consider instead the uh, we move to the conformal window, again, we expect a suppression of non trivial topological sectors, but here the role of the conformal symmetry may help us in understanding many other aspects of the theory. Which moves me to the last, to the very last uh, topic, which is the one of, of axioms and CP strong. Um, in this case, the quantum, uh, we have seen that the quantum young mills has a theta term. Um, and uh, here I wrote the theta term in terms of lambda and uh, in order to make explicit that when uh, the number of colors goes to infinity, the theta term disappears. But this theta term also disappears when one, at least one of the quarks in the standard model is massless. Uh, but we know by experimental observations, of course, by measurements uh, and all possible indications uh, that all those quarks in the standard model are massive. Uh, therefore, this theta term is there. Uh, actually, not really the theta term, but the theta bar term, the shifted term, because this is the object that is observable due to the presence of a face, of a possible face uh, in the quark mass matrices. Uh, then there is also the intriguing fact that FF tilde has, of course, different transformation properties than F square uh, that uh, appears also in the action. Uh, and in fact, it breaks parity and it breaks time reversal. And if CPT is conserved, then it breaks CP, the product. And that is what, uh, of course, uh, that we can talk of strong CP. That means the violation of CP conservation, CP symmetry within the strong sector of the standard model. If this is present, if this term is present, then, for example, we have a contribution to the neutron electric dipole moment. But upper bounds on the neutron electric dipole moments are very stringent already and force theta bar to be a very tiny uh, quantity. Now, a tiny quantity, this raised what is known as the CP strong problem. Why theta bar, if has no reason to be zero, why it is so small? I let you notice, of course, that since we don't have yet a sorry, solution. Sorry, there is one minute left before the next talk. Could you please wrap up? Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize. Sorry. Uh, I was, uh, yeah. No. Um, 
yes, so this is the last slide actually. Um, so the one possibility for a solution is the axion. The axion is the Golston boson of, uh, an extra, uh, of an extra U1 that can be added. And the nice property is that the mass is actually inversely proportional to the decay, to the decay uh, constant. So these objects, uh, the axions, uh, can be naturally, uh, naturally light and uh, um, be naturally light, they have a reason to exist and interact uh, actually uh, quite weakly. Um, the, uh, the decay constant uh, around 250 GV is uh, uh, ruled out already. So we have to look for large decay constant. And surprisingly, but also uh, very interestingly, there is a proliferation of experiments uh, that are uh, being done. And here I show, so you have holoscopes, uh, helioscopes, uh, telescopes, uh, uh, searching for uh, axions produced by the sun or axions as candidate for cold dark matter. And here I just mentioned uh, a, a quite uh, the projection of uh, YAXO, which is a new proposed experiment uh, that actually has in the next years, we'll have uh, quite uh, a, 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 the hope of, of constraining uh, stringently the uh, possibility that actions, uh, uh, that actions exist. And here I conclude, uh, sorry for the, uh, for the uh, long, uh, I didn't realize. <laughs> I uh, th th yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, there is no time for questions. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would like to invite all the participants to use the chat to ask questions directly to the speaker. OK, so in the meantime, we move on to the next uh, talk. Uh, so, um, Jay, could you please prepare your, your slides? Uh, uh, this next talk will be given by Jay Armas from uh, the University of Amsterdam. <clears throat> and because we wanted to achieve a very smooth transition between high energy physics and soft matter, we have a soft matter talk given by a high, high energy physicist. <laughs> Jay, uh, please go ahead. Right, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if it's, if I, yeah, it's partially soft matter, but I think uh, it al there's also some kind of geophysics in here. So I'm, I'm going to speak about uh, topological waves in hydrodynamics. So it's it's topologic, topology, uh, physics, but in, in, in the context of continuum systems. And it's based on, on some work I did together with Richard Green, uh, Jan de Boer, and uh, Luca Giomi. So uh, it's understandable why I was invited to speak here. Um, so uh, in, in Topological properties in condensed matter systems, um, where many of these ideas originated from, uh, as you also saw in the talk by Christiana, um, have been used to understand multiple kinds of phenomena, like the quantum Hall effect and uh, topological insulators, etc. But then uh, more recently, people realized that these sort of ideas were general enough that also applied to uh, continuum and classical systems. And it's in that context that uh, I'm, I'm going to give this uh, talk. So let me start with uh, planet Earth. So I'll, mo I'll motivate this from a geophysics point of view, but then I'll move on a bit to soft matter. So this is planet Earth. And as we know, it has a large body of water and it's rotating. Uh, uh, it's spinning uh, 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 along uh, an axis of rotation. And uh, that rotation uh, gives rise to many effects, um, including a Coriolis type force. And that, that affects. Your slides are not uh, going through. Sorry? Your slides are not going through. We're still uh, seeing. I'm, not, I'm not moving. I'm still on planet yes. Earth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, so certain effects that uh, show up uh, when, you, when you rotate something are, are, sort of, are effects on ocean waves. And here you can see uh, a picture. Sorry, of, sorry uh, Jay, we are still looking at your title slides. Ah, uh, but it's moving. Uh, it's moving. Uh, here. It's moving on your on your computer, is it? Yes. Uh, can you try to reshare your screen? Maybe. Yes, I will reshare. Sorry, now I understand. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it moving now? It is moving. Yes. Okay. So I was on planet Earth. <laughs> And now I was saying that on planet Earth, there's uh, a few effects like uh, waves uh, on the ocean are somehow trapped on the equator. And uh, so here you can see an intensity map of the Earth at a given point 
uh, in time, um, specifically time of the year. And you can see that there is some in high intensity here of waves around the equator. So there's some kind of trapped waves around the equator. And in fact, uh, these uh, things have been measured uh, for many years. This is a collaboration uh, clouds from the 70s that also measured uh, these kind of waves. Here is a, a wave number and here is frequency. These are sort of dispersion relations for the type of waves that can show up. These are called Kelvin waves. And, and, and here there's gravity waves and Rossby waves. And, uh, and, and these are also measured in the atmosphere because you know, the Earth is rotating, is dragging the atmosphere and the kind of, uh, same kind of effects are there as well. And if you uh, compare these kind of ideas with uh, uh, condensed matter, you see, for instance, uh, in the case of uh, Dirac fermion that was worked out a long time ago, there is some sort of uh, you know, uh, bulk modes. So there is some frequencies um, in your system uh, that describe, uh, let's say, uh, uh, some, some bulk dispersion relations. And there is a kind of gap between these bulk modes. And there is some sort of mode that propagates in the middle of that gap that you call a chiral edge mode that is propagating in a specific direction. And you can ascribe a specific topological invariant to these bulk bands called the churn number. And the difference in that churn number, uh, in this case, for instance, gives you a plus one, which tells you that there is a, a unidirectional mode propagating in between these two bulk bands. So this is a, a very general picture that shows up in many systems in condensed matter. But now you can open uh, a, a geophysical fluid dynamics book and you'll find uh, a picture of this kind. So these are sort of the, the type of uh, uh, frequencies or excitations that uh, you can uh, find by solving a system describing the propagation of ocean waves on the surface of the Earth. And you'll find these gravity waves these planetary Rossby waves down here, and also these Yanai waves and, and Kelvin waves here. And you could, by making the parallel between this picture and, and this picture, see that you know, perhaps you can interpret these two modes propagating here, the Yanai wave and the Kelvin wave, as topological modes, and these ones here as sort of bulk bands. And in fact, that's exactly what has happened. Uh, in, in 2017, Del Plas and others realized that there was a way of describing this system in analogous way as it is described in condensed matter systems, in quantum matter, and ascribe a specific topological invariant, the churn number, to this system, which in this case gives a plus two, which is indeed the number of chiral edge modes propagating between these two bulk bands. Okay. So now the question is uh, that I want to address is, you know, uh, these are planets. This is a specific planet, uh, planet Earth. It has a spherical geometry, but planets are not necessarily spherical. And you could imagine the whole uh, world of soft matter and, and cells and cellular membranes and all the possible shapes that these objects can have. They can be curved surfaces with different shapes. And the question is, you know, how many chiral edge modes are you expecting to find um, in an arbitrary surface? Uh, though I will put some constraint on that surface in the sense that it has to have some kind of rotational isometry so that it can host um, rotating flows in equilibrium. And the answer that we have come up with can be summarized in, in a very short formula. So here you have some arbitrary surface uh, that is rotating with a specific angular velocity and is uh, sort of uh, rotationally invariant. So it has an axis of rotation. And what we find is that the difference between these churn numbers that we can calculate across the minima and maxima of uh, uh, the distance between the rotation axis and the surface. So you can call it some kind of equators. So if you calculate the difference between these churn numbers across each of these things and take into account the fact that it's either a minima or a maxima, that sum across, uh, along the whole surface will give you the number 
of chiral edge modes that you will find in that surface. But besides that, you can also show that that number is equal to the Euler characteristic of the surface. So it's a, a, a different type of index theorem than what you encounter in, in the context of quantum matter. In the sense, uh, in the context of quantum matter, the index theorem is usually just these two parts. The difference in the churn numbers in your system is equal to the number of chiral edge modes. But here you can actually make a relation with the real space topology of the surface that tells you the Euler characteristic gives you the total number of edge modes on the surface. So that's, that's sort of the main result. And I will try to show just a little bit uh, how do we get there. So I can start just very briefly with uh, the example of a Dirac fermion in two plus one dimensions, which is described by this uh, very simple equation. And here, this M is a mass parameter. And I'm interested in the sort of uh, conventional system in which uh, I have a kind of interface. So uh, this uh, mass parameter changes from one side to the other of the interface just by changing side on one side and, and then uh, having an opposite side in the other one. And uh, you can look for plane wave solutions of this system. You can write some equations of motion that look like a Schrodinger-like equation or Hamiltonian equation for the evolution of these uh, plane waves. And you arrive at a specific Hamiltonian written in uh, momentum space. And from that Hamiltonian, you can compute some eigenvectors uh, and then compute a kind of gauge connection. And from there, which is a Berry connection, and from there calculate the churn number by using that Berry connection into the Berry curvature and, uh, and uh, integrate it over momentum space. And you find an expression of this case for of this form for the Dirac fermion. It has a specific uh, 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 sort of effect of a regulator that you have to put in there, but it doesn't matter at the end. And the difference in this specific system is that you find uh, one chiral H mode, which is indeed uh, the kind of result you find for a Dirac fermion. You have some bulk bands here, and then there is a mass gap here and the chiral fermion and, and the chiral edge mode uh, propagating in between. Now, if I go to the case that I started with, with uh, planet Earth, but I generalize it and I include not just a spherical geometry, but an arbitrary geometry with an axis of rotation that, uh, that is uh, uh, axisymmetric, I can describe the two-dimensional line element uh, very uh, generally in this form with some functions p and r and an overall length uh, l. Uh, and then what I, what I uh, use to, or what the equations that determine the evolution of this flow on this surface are just mass momentum conservation. So these are uh, uh, the equations, so-called shallow water wave equations that you would use to model the waves on the, on the surface of the Earth. So there's a specific density here and a velocity field, and here, uh, gravitational acceleration. And what you do is then you, you, you try to describe the most general steady state, equilibrium state that solves these equations. It's a kind of rotating fluid with a specific angular velocity. That would be the angular velocity of the Earth. Uh, and then an av a density in equilibrium that is given by a specific form in terms of uh, average densities and positions. And you can, uh, again, uh, in, like with a Dirac fermion, you can sort of uh, perturb this system away from equilibrium, and you find a Hamiltonian for those perturbations, for the evolution of the, those perturbations, in which this M parameter is a kind of ineffective mass in this Hamiltonian that is given just in terms of properties of uh, the surface. So this R function and this P function were functions um, in the metric, in the line element of the surface itself. So the mass is sort of determined by the geometry of the surface. And you can calculate uh, what are the sort of modes that um, exist there if you keep this uh, mass constant. So if you 
temperature on one side of the equator, in which this is approximately constant, and then changes sign on the other side of the equator. And you find the specific uh, uh, frequency versus momentum with a mass gap given by this M. And you can, again, calculate a churn number in the same way that you could for the Dirac fermion. And you find that in this case, this is plus two. So the general figure you find is, is of this form in which you have some kind of bulk bands here in this gray region. And then you have two edge modes. This is the Yanai wave and the Kelvin wave entering the bulk band. And indeed, this method gives you that there is a difference of uh, two modes if you look at, uh, at this part of the diagram entering that region. Now, I didn't assume spherical geometry, so it's, it's, a, it's a very general statement for uh, axisymmetric surfaces. And you can use, uh, the, there's more than one way of showing this, but you can apply Morse theorem. You can show that this falls under Morse's theorem. Um, you can apply Morse's theorem then to uh, sort of link the differences between the churn numbers along each of these equators on the surface to the Euler characteristic of the surface. And this is how uh, we reach um, this uh, conclusion. And it's a kind of uh, example of a bulk edge correspondence, but now in, in, in continuum classical physics. You can use this sort of idea then to take a kind of arbitrary surface and locate the exact uh, uh, sort of location of where the uh, edge modes are propagating. So for the sphere, it was in the equator, like I showed in the beginning. If you have a torus, you will have some modes propagating in the outer equator and some modes with the opposite direction propagated in the inner equator. So the total number of edge modes is zero for a torus and plus two for the sphere. You could have uh, more exotic geometries like the catenoid here which is infinitely extended. So the part in which we connect to the Euler characteristic doesn't apply here, but you can still use what we've done to locate the precise uh, point where the edge modes are propagating, which are here in the sort of center of the catenoid. And here in this more exotic surface, which is actually singular on the axis, you can also find uh, some uh, edge modes propagating along this um, uh, equator. We, we can think about other kinds of systems, which are not uh, passive systems describing uh, just uh, simple fluids on surfaces, but you can consider active systems in which you have uh, some kind of uh, uh, bacteria or entities that are uh, self-propelled. And in this case, the dynamics of the system is not just uh, uh, the shallow water waves, but they are additional terms uh, which uh, model the driving uh, of, of, um, of these systems. So here is a kind of uh, force term that depends in, in these coefficients alpha and beta that break this momentum conservation equation. But nevertheless, you can put them in on arbitrary surfaces. You can find steady states that are slightly more complicated and then perturb around those steady states to find an effective Hamiltonian that describes the evolution of those perturbations. This effective Hamiltonian is very similar to the case of shallow water waves, except that now there is this zeta parameter here that is related to the uh, kind of activity parameters that one introduced here via this force term. And also there's a, this C coefficient here that measures uh, uh, deviations away from Galilean symmetry in this system. But nevertheless, in certain cases, you can find some kind of bulk edge correspondence. Uh, uh, for instance, when the activity is close to zero or very small, uh, you still find two edge modes entering these bulk bands. The bulk bands are still uh, differentiated, so there's still a difference between the top bulk band and the bottom bulk band. And you find that the churn number is, uh, is uh, plus two, uh, counting these two edge modes here. But once you turn on activity by a bit, you start seeing that these bulk bands merge, and then the churn number becomes somewhat 
uh, undefined. You cannot use it to compute these things. So it's, it's sort of an open problem um, exactly how to do that because when the activity is this high, the system actually becomes non permission and, and, and the churn number is no longer valid. Nevertheless, you can still solve for these modes and, and, and count how many are here. But what about uh, waves in other astrophysical objects? So you could uh, uh, definitely think that uh, uh, there's definitely more than planets out there. Um, uh, there's stars and other things. And uh, you could think whether or not this sort of uh, mechanism and, uh, and the existence of these topological modes in, in, in fluids is universal in some sense. And there is, in fact, another case in which this, um, this seems to be relevant, which uh, uh, is the case of a star, for instance, our sun here. Um, you can decompose the structure of our sun into different parts, as you can see here, taken from NASA, a convective zone, a tachocline, a radiative zone, a core, etc., and the corona. And um, there is evidence that here in the solar tachocline, uh, there is a, 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 a system of equations that describes the evolution of this plasma with magnetic fields. So these are called the shallow water MHD equations, magnetohydrodynamic equations. And there's also evidence, uh, uh, experimental evidence, that this kind that there are excitations or uh, wave propagation in the solar tachocline that obeys a specific form. And in fact, you can uh, solve those equations in the same way that you could solve the shallow water wave equations and obtain a diagram of this form in which you still have some Rossby waves here, but magneto Rossby waves because they involve magnetic fields, and also some uh, gravity waves here on the top. And then there is a kind of uh, Yanai and Kelvin um, uh, magneto waves propagating into the, uh, in the bulk of this. And it is possible also to ascribe a churn number to the system because the system is still permission. And indeed, it gives you plus two, which is exactly uh, the type of edge modes that are propagating um, in the solar tackle climb, um, potentially. So this is work uh, to appear soon. So with that, uh, I'll just conclude. There is a general uh, mechanism for topological protection in many cases. This seems to be um, uh, the existence of this isometry, this rotational invariant, invariant symmetry on the surface, together with the fact that the surface is curved, this interplay uh, gives rise to these edge modes that one can um, track down generally. Um, we don't know exactly how to model or, or whether these systems, or if it makes sense to speak about topological modes in the context of active fluids, uh, especially with that large activity, because then you enter the realm of non permission topology, and it's not clear what, what's the invariant that describes those modes in this context. Uh, we also haven't explored what happens if the surface has boundaries. So the cases I described were uh, cases in which the surface is closed or is infinite. Um, it would be nice if it would be possible to prove the bulk edge correspondence for these cases, like using a Tia Singer theorems, like uh, Elisabetta mentioned in her talk. And then there's also the question about how robust is this mechanism. So these things are found at the level of uh, linearized hydrodynamics. One could think about what are the effects of nonlinearities, uh, what are the effects of uh, turbulence or even what is what happens if I sort of wiggle the surface by a little bit by, for instance, slightly deforming the equator or slightly breaking the axis symmetry. So these are questions that would sort of be relevant to understand how robust these mechanisms are. And with that, I'll, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have one minute. Does anybody have a quick talk, a quick uh, question, sorry. Well, if not, I, I, I maybe I, I can make a remark. 
because it just occurred to me that another limitation for the high activity regime, in addition to the non-hermeticity, which is of course like problematic, is the fact that most of fluids are unstable. Most of active fluids are unstable uh, in, in the high activity regimes. They, they become unstable to something chaotic, so the problem uh, the changes quite, quite a bit. Uh, there is a question. Um, Dimitrios Kromidas from Leiden asks, uh, is, is there a way to cast the cross C, quotation mark phase, within the framework you described? Uh, I don't know what the cross C is. Me neither. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll keep that for, for the discussion. <laughs> Uh, in the interest of time, I would suggest to go ahead uh, to move on with the last uh, speaker, which is also our uh, international guest, uh, Professor Randy Kamian. Randy, can you uh, please share your screen? Yes, one moment. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm really honored that uh, you invited me. I really wish I were there. Um, <laughs> you, can you see? Uh, now we see you. We don't see your slides. Oh yeah, because I because I didn't do share screen because I just don't know what I'm doing. Hold on. Yeah. Host disabled. Uh, is okay. So the the technicians, can you please uh, co-host uh, uh, Professor Kamian, so he can share his his slides. Luca, I think you have to do this as host. I have to do oh, it. You're all also co-host. Okay. 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 Very good. Very good. Uh, but now I think you are right. Now you are. I think you are, uh, Randy. No, not yet. No, no, no. So let me try then. Uh, no, I don't have actually this option on my on my. I don't have this option. Yeah, the online amplify event marketing is the host host. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, talk name allow. Yeah, so I don't. Uh, is, is there any any uh, technician uh, connected at the moment that can help us with this? Because I don't have the option of co-hosting uh, somebody actually on my on my Zoom. Can you can you can you change the settings so that everybody can share their screen? Let's see. No, I don't think I do. Mm -hmm. I don't think I do. Uh, yeah, so they are, they, they are online uh, Amplify people. Where, are, you, are you there? I just asked Luca because he was there. We can make Randall, uh, we can share a screen for everybody. With okay, them. that's fine. Yes? Then nobody yeah, fine. present, please. <laughs> yeah, I'm not worried. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. You see it now. All right. So let me, let me, uh, uh, one minute to, to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Andy Kamian from University of Pennsylvania. So he uh, got his PhD at Harvard University under the supervision of uh, David Nelson. After that, he moved to uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton and then to University of Philadelphia, <clears throat> where he still is. And Randy is really one of the people who really made an effort to uh, bring uh, soft matter physics and geometry and topology you know, close to, to one another. He gave a, a several contributions, especially for what concerned the description of topological defects in crystals, in liquid crystals, as metric especially. He also wrote a wonderful review about an introductory review of differential geometry for in soft matter, which is published in the Review of Modern Physics, the journal that now, uh, of which now Randy is also the editor in chief. Uh, so thank you, Randy, for accepting our invitation. I also wish you were here in person. I also wish we could have a beer tonight. <laughs> but you know, exactly. I, think, <laughs> I look forward to hearing you. Please go ahead. All right. Well, I hope I just don't don't disappoint you. So um, I'm going to tell you guys about the Pyrrhus Navarro barrier. And here, um, everything will be defined, right? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I want this, right? So 
this is a picture from Pyro's original paper. And you see Pyro's had a crystal on top and a crystal on bottom. But the crystal uh, on top has one more column than the crystal on bottom. And right in between, there's a place here where there's some sort of defect, where there's a place where you go from having four nearest neighbors to five nearest neighbors or possibly three nearest neighbors. So why would you care about this? So let me uh, remind you, right? Some of you know about this, right? There are places called libraries and they're filled with books. And books were the way that we transmitted information in the last century and centuries before that. And sometimes there are a lot of books. And because there are a lot of books, you want to store them compactly. And so you have this compact shelving. Now, if you tried to move the entire bookcase all at once, that'd be a lot of work. It would be hard to move a whole bookcase at once or a whole five rows of five columns of books. So you move them one at a time. And this was Pyrrell's idea of how defects moved in a crystal. So instead of having to take half the crystal, cut it and slide it over the other half of the crystal, which would mean that the energy barrier would scale like the interface between them. So it'd scale like the area of the crystal or the area of the, of the uh, cut surface. He said, oh, you can move it one row at a time, one column at a time. And this red thing is the dislocation and it's moving. And in, 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 in his work and the borrow's follow-up work, the idea was is that the crystal lattice must give some sort of potential to the dislocations, a potential that varies at the same uh, frequency or wavelength as the crystal itself. So um, we wanted to sort of reinterpret that. And we wanted to give an explanation which um, really relied on the topology of the crystal. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So first of all, what do I mean by a crystal? I could say it's these atoms or molecules or whatever you are, or I could say, and this is, of course, how we look at crystals through x-ray scattering. I could say, oh, there's these density waves. There's a blue density wave. That gives me the layers in the, in the rows. And there's a red density wave. And that's the columns. And the uh, molecules or atoms or whatever they are, they sit at the double peaks. They sit at the place where there's a peak in blue and a peak in red, double peaks. And here in the middle, this is a double, a double trough where there's, where there's nothing of any kind or less of every kind. Here is a half trough where it's a peak in the red, but not quite a peak in the blue. And so you characterize the crystal by the peaks in the superposition of density waves. And of course, this can go off into any dimension you like. So let me simplify it a little bit. Let me say, instead of thinking about the, um, the, the crystal, Let's ignore the blue layers just for a second, right? And this is the simple example. And you look at the red layers and the red layers you see, what the red layers do is the red layers have add an extra row. I've rotated everything, so now it's a row, which is exactly what happens when you have a dislocation in a smectic. Why do we focus on smectics? Because the smectic is easier to understand. It has a smaller configuration space. But you'll see that everything you understand for the smectic then applies to the, all the crystals at once. Now, even though I'm drawing the smectic and here are the layers, we're more sophisticated now after we saw that last slide. Here are the layers, the black layers, and the blue layers, they're the minima. So these are single minima. There's a density wave. It goes, it, it's loud, it's soft, it's loud, it's soft, it's loud, right? It goes up and down as you uh, go across the crystal. And there is a disclination. There's a place here where even though you know what layer you're on, you don't know which way the layers point. Are the molecules here, is the layer normal pointing up or is the layer normal pointing down? Likewise, there's another disclination here where, again, there's an ambiguity in which way the layer normal points. This is a minus one half. This is a plus one half. Okay. So how do we describe the smectic? Like I said, you have a density wave, like so. There's the background density. Delta rho is the order parameter. Cosine phi is some oscillating phase. If you tell me the density, I can now go backwards and calculate and find the phase for you. But the problem with finding the phase, the inverse problem is not as easy as you'd think because there's an ambiguity. One is a silly ambiguity or an 
Well, it's you know, it's an important ambiguity. Phi and phi plus two pi give you exactly the same density wave. So there's a redundancy in the uh, description. But there's another thing. Since this crystal or the layers are where the density maxima are, I also can't tell you the value of phi. In fact, I can't tell you the value of phi anyhow up to a sign. Phi and minus phi give me completely equivalent symmetric density. So let me think about for a second the structure of the symmetric ground state. Now, let me say, right, and people have already talked about this, right? The symmetric enjoys two goldstone modes, right? There's one goldstone mode, which has to do with shifting the layers up and down. We'll call that little phi, and they can shift from zero to two pi. And there's a goldstone mode that is associated with rotation that it inherits from the pneumatic phase that lives above it. So the crystal not only gets to choose where it sits, it also gets to choose at what orientation it sits. Now, usually those two goldstone modes are independent. And this thing here, which I call the ground state manifold, um, would have the coordinates, the coordinates of the, all the possible ground states are precisely uh, parameterized by the goldstone modes theta and phi. You can see there's an interesting thing that uh, was pointed out to me, at least by Hans Reiner Trebine, that in fact, this ground state manifold is a coin bottle, which is a little weird, but it's essential. Um, what do I mean by that? You see, if you, if you shift and then rotate by pi, that's the same thing as shifting in the other direction, which means that if you shift by this little amount here, that's equivalent to shifting by this amount on the other side. Right, because this is shifting, this is shifting up, this is shifting down. I mean, shifting here and shifting here is the same. I mean, here and here, but here and here are equivalent because of phi goes to phi plus two pi. Okay. And as a result of that, the Klein bottle has, you know, an interesting non abelian fundamental group. People get excited about that. Um, but the most important thing is the thing I said, is that the Klein bottle compared to say a torus has this twist in it. There's a twist, okay. So back to the smectic, right? So here's the smectic. Now, here I'm drawing for you the Klein bottle again, right? So here's the Klein bottle. I, or, I switched the orientation, sorry, All right? Theta is the rotation. So I can rotate from zero to pi. And I can also shift from zero to two pi. And what is this path? What is this red path? First of all, this red path is a closed path because it starts here and it ends here. These points are identified because I've identified these two edges in that topological way. So this is a closed loop on the ground state manifold that can't be contracted. That means that it's a topological defect, it's protected. And it's a dislocation. On this side, the phase is zero, and on this side, the phase is two pi. This is adding an extra two pi of phase, right, as you go around a particular defect. And the only way to have this work is for phi to be undefined. Phi can't have a value at a certain point if phi goes from zero to two pi. And as usual, the way that we fix that, like in a superfluid or a superconductor or anything else, is you make delta rho vanish. If delta rho vanishes, then it's okay. Phi doesn't have to be well-defined and the density is perfectly smooth. But I can do something else. Something else I can do is I can go from here to here, but I can use a slightly different path. I'm gonna take this path and I'm gonna go, right? So it's the same closed path, right? Same closed path that we had before. But it's a funny closed path because in fact, what I've done is I've added these vertical segments. The horizontal segments actually cancel because see this one goes from zero to pi and this one goes from zero to pi, but in the other direction because the orientation of the top is twisted with respect to the orientation of the bottom because it's corn bottle. And so um, I've actually taken this dislocation and broken it up into two disclinations. And, here they are, like I promised. But these disclinations, why did I pick these particular places? Why did I go up and down right in the middle? Because I like symmetry? No, 
You see, there's a problem. Problematically, if I start and try to make a disclination, a place where the orientation is not defined, I can go from here straight up. This is going from the, uh, ang from the layer pi over two, but it gets identified up here with the layer three pi over two, right? Because the orientation of this one is opposite the orientation of the bottom one. All right, so this is three pi over two plus or you know plus two pi n. This is not a closed defect loop. It doesn't start and end at the same place. To start and end at the same place, it would have to go across like this. If it started and ended at the same place, now you see that it has a dislocation component also. It has motion in the phi direction along as well as having motion along the theta direction. Fortunately. There are some special points, the fixed points. They're the fixed points of these maps. These fixed points tell you that if you take phi to be zero, so if you look at a place where there's a maximum, phi equals zero, and you do a rotation there, you can go from zero to pi, and that's actually a closed loop. Because phi equals zero, and phi equals two pi, and four pi, and zero, and minus two pi are all equivalent to each other. Likewise, if you start in the middle, so you start in the middle where phi is pi, and you rotate by pi, you get back to something that's pi mod two pi. So this is a closed loop, and this is a closed loop. This one on the left, on the right, is the same as the closed loop on the left. You have two closed loops. There are two kinds of disclinations that are pure, pure disclinations that do not have any dislocation component. And so you see that this picture on the right is a way of taking the dislocation and turning it into two disclinations with no dislocation. And who cares if you don't have a dislocation? If there's no dislocation, phi is well defined. <laughs> phi is defined. And if phi is defined, I don't have to make delta rho vanish. The order parameter delta rho does not have to vanish. Delta rho can maintain whatever value it wants to be because there's some crystal and there's some condensate energy. So if you take a dislocation and you break it into these special disclinations, then you don't have to melt the crystal. So that's a low energy way of making a dislocation. The problem is always going to be when you want to move the dislocation, all right? And that's what the Lando piles, uh, sorry, the piles and the borrow barrier is about. So <clears throat> on a dislocation, you can't define phi. Since you can't define phi, delta rho has to vanish. So let me, here's the logic, right? This is like this is like pretending we're Socrates or something. On dislocation, phi is not defined, so delta rho has to vanish. That means you pay the condensation energy. On disclinations that are <coughs> localized, so that the dislocations sit at integer multiples of pi, then the phase can be well defined, even though the gradient isn't. So even though you don't know which way the layers are pointing, you know which layer you're on. <clears throat> and that means that <clears throat> the zero energy location of the disclinations is determined entirely by topology. It's by this twist in the Klein bottle. It wouldn't be true if it were torus, and torus would be something different. It's this Klein bottle twist that's giving you this extra information. It's the fact that rotations act on translations, that the rotation group and the translation group aren't independent. Okay. Now, one of the things that I really like about liquid crystals, right, is that you can see the topology. So here are the topological defects. This is a cholesteric that was studied by Ivan Smolyuk and Oleg Laurentovich. And they actually showed that as, the, as a dislocation moves, it hops. It goes from being something where the white layers, see the white layer has the half defect, to the black layer has the half defect, to the white layer has a half defect. It moves in kinks. I have these movies. Let's see if they play. <clears throat> Let's see, what do I have to do to make them play? There you go. All right. This is unpublished work by Joseph Paulson. This is just a, uh, a sheet on some uh, soft, soft, it's a, it's a not stretchy sheet on a stretchy, on a stretchy surface. And he's just squishing it with his fingers. But it's making ripples. These are ripples in the sheet, right? Because you have the squishy surface and it's rippling. But it has dislocations. Orange is a peak and black is a trough and it's moving across and you can see how it moves and jumps, right? And what it's doing there is it's doing its best not to melt. After all, 
Melting in a crystal is one thing where the order parameter vanishes. Melting on a sheet of plastic means that you have to either tear a hole in the plastic or it has to distort a lot because it has to go from a place where there's, it has to you know, sit in the middle between a very high a height and a low. So <clears throat> plastic, plastic sheets don't have, don't have holes in them and they don't make holes as they go. So you can see it's doing this. It's trying to move by hopping, right? <clears throat> so how do you do this in a crystal? In a full crystal, everything's the same, except now we retain the blue layers. Now we keep the blue layers, which means that we have one density wave. That's the red density wave. And then we also add the blue density wave. A 2D crystal has two phases that are going. Each phase is related to the reciprocal lattice vector. These are the uh, things you would get if you did Bragg scattering, G. And there's an offset. So g dot x is telling you the periodicity and the orientation. And then phi is the offset, which corresponds to these phase modes, you know, translation modes. You can slide the thing up and down and left and right and sideways. <clears throat> what happens though? Under a rotation, suppose I rotate, suppose I have a square lattice and I rotate by pi on two. When I rotate by pi on two, theta changes, the angle changes. But what happens is phi one becomes phi two and phi two becomes minus phi one. You see the rotations act on the phases also. If I had a rectangular lattice or an oblique lattice, I could do a rotation by pi. If I do a rotation by pi, phi goes to minus itself and phi two goes to minus itself. So in other words, I can talk about a order parameter space, a ground state manifold where I have three coordinates, right? I have theta, phi and phi, like so. And then you can say, aha, right? What happens as you go up, if, ro if theta rotates by pi, like it goes here on the rectangular one, you glue this square to the bottom square, but there's a twist. And this twist changes the values of phi and the minus themselves. If instead on a square, you have theta is pi on two, then you take this square and you glue it to a new square that's pi on two rotated from the top. So these are like <clears throat> generalizations of Klein bottles in higher dimensions with a twist. <clears throat> and here I've drawn them like so. And in the triangular lattice, it's a little funky. You have to add a third phase to make everything work because the triangular lattice has three, uh, <clears throat> three sets of Bragg, Bragg planes. Uh, but in there you have a hexagon and you rotate it by, uh, by two pi on six and glue it to the next hexagon. And what we're showing in the blue, green, and red, those are the fixed points. Those are the places where you can have a pure disclination. If you want to have theta change from zero to pi or zero to pi on two, you can do it as long as you pick those special values of phi, because then they stay fixed as you go from the bottom to the top. <clears throat> so you can work it all out. You can work out exactly what happens if you have a uh, an oblique rectangular or center rectangular lattice. You have rotations by pi. That's one of the symmetries. This is the symmetry operation where theta phi one and phi two go to this. The angles you can have are plus or minus pi. Those are the disclinations. And you can then calculate that the disclinations are allowed to sit at any of these places. All right, so they're allowed to sit at double maxima, double minima, half maxima, and half minima. Right, pi is the phase. If you have a square lattice, you find that there are two kinds of defects. You can have the pi on two defects that we're used to. They can either sit at the phase maxima, double maxima, or double minima. In other words, they sit on the lattice or they sit on the dual lattice. You also can have the pi ones. After all, they have they have a lower they have a lower symmetry, but you can have disclinations of pi. They sit on all the same places that the, the, uh, the rectangular one does. After all, square lattice is also a rectangular lattice. Finally, in the triangular lattice, like I said, there's a third phase field. <clears throat> but roughly speaking, theta goes to theta plus pi on three. It shifts the phi's around in this particular way. You can find the fixed points. And you find that if you have a two pi over six disclination, it has to sit on a double peak, it has to sit on the lattice. 
You can have these larger disclinations, which can sit in other places. But what does this tell you? This tells you something that, you know, I've known all my life, or I've known all your life, or, you know, whatever, right? On a triangular lattice, the disclinations sit on the lattice. So there's the one peak, it's the lattice point. This is your classic seven defect. And here's your classic five defect. Here's the five, seven disclination pair that gives you a dislocation. Okay. <clears throat> they have to sit on the lattice. Those are the only places the disclination can sit. <clears throat> on a square lattice, it's a little different. On a square lattice, here is a double peak. The double peak is a three. You see it's threefold coordinated. And then you say, oh, <clears throat> there's a double trough, right? There's the double trough. What's that? Well, that's a five-fold disclination. That's a five-fold disclination on the dual lattice. So you have a five-fold disclination on the dual lattice, or you have a, and a three-fold disclination on the actual lattice. These two disclinations, this is very important. These dis two disclinations cannot annihilate each other. One sits on a maximum, one sits on a minimum. The same is true on the triangular lattice. To get from one to the other, they have to go through a place that isn't a minimum or isn't a maximum. And in other words, in order to annihilate, it would have to melt. And melting costs energy. But you also see right, that sometimes these phase disclinations, which are the essential to this argument, are actually the geometric disclinations that we grew up with, the 5-7 pair, the 5-3 pair. right? But it's not always the case. Right, so let me, I get to the end, right? The topology of the grand stout manifold constrains where the disclinations sit. In order to move a disclination, a mover, in order to have a low energy dislocation, it breaks up into disclinations that sit in special places. In order to move the dislocation, you have to move the disclinations off those special places. There's no way to have it be any other way. So the disc, in order for a dislocation to move, the disclinations have to move. And for disclinations to move, the crystal has to melt. And it's going to melt every time it jumps by one lattice spacing. So that is the same barrier. And the energy is coming just from the condensation. And we have no atomic model, right? No atomic model of what's going on, just sort of a Landau theory, right? <clears throat> the thing that I think is really neat is that on the one hand, you can actually extract where the geometric dis where the disclinations sit, you see that in the triangle and square lattice, the phase disclinations and the geometric disclinations are the same. But I'd also like to point out that when you talk about melting of a rectangular crystal, you don't think of that as melting in terms of disclination unbinding. You don't think about plus pi and minus pi disclinations. Those would be enormous in energy. <clears throat> Those are geometric disclinations. However, they melt through the phase disclinations. It's the same phase disclinations. It's just a diff the geometry is different. The geometry and the phase are not always in concert. <clears throat> I'll end by saying uh, <clears throat> what happens when you go into the third dimension. Of course, in cross section, a three dimensional line defect is the same as what I've drawn here. But now you can imagine the line defects wrapping around each other and giving you extra topological information. Um, I want to credit everybody involved with this. Helen Ansel, who is uh, uh, my student, is now at Northwestern. Brooke Hawking, who is uh, at Bristol and is a student of Tom Michonne, who's a uh, faculty at Bristol. And we were funded by funders. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Randy. That was a really, really a wonderful talk. Uh, so there is there is uh, there, there are already some questions. Uh, I do have one, but I will leave the first one to the audience. So uh, Anton Akmerov is asking, uh, what consequences does this description have for actual crystals uh, made out of point-like particles? <clears throat> well, I mean, I guess I'd say <clears throat> these are actual crystals made out of point-like particles. How do I? I mean. There's a way of doing this. Hold on. I know how to do this. Mm. Right. Like this one. So this is a crystal made out of point-like particles. And when I said that um, I look at the density waves, so let's, uh, let's play that. Oops. Oh, there we go. OK. 
<laughs> so you can see it. Here's the density waves. The density waves, Anton, they are just <clears throat> the first set of Fourier modes. If you want to make them more localized, then go ahead and add more Fourier modes, hmm. right? You can add more Fourier modes of the harmonics of these Fourier modes. So I imagine cosines and sines, you add higher harmonics, and then you have the order parameters in front of the higher harmonics. And the first order parameter, B non-zero, is what sets the crystal. And then all the other ones, just by coupling, right, will <clears throat> take on non-zero values at the transition. So the density wave approach and the atom wave and this, where the atoms sit is exactly the same um, in the long wavelength limit. So we're talking about we're talking about long wavelength things. Now you could certainly ask me, <clears throat> could I use this to calculate the barrier energy? And the answer is no. The, this is a way of of saying that there's a barrier energy from the general arguments of Landau theory. Does that does that answer your question? We will find out. Um, I, I also have another question. Um, the type of motion that you described is what I believe is called glide, right? This location glide. Yes, uh, yes. Is there, is there anything uh, that we can also say about climb, uh, which is more energetic, maybe more impo less important, but still? Right, so climb, climb is when, oops, go back. Uh, this is a general audience, so let me, uh, okay. So climb is when instead of the dislocations moving left and right, this dislocation moves up and down. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that in order to do that, you have to bring in an atom, has to come in from infinity, mm -hmm. right? Or from somewhere, or this atom has to be removed out to infinity. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> climb requires um, interstitials and diffusion and is, much more difficult to make happen. Glide is something where there's no, where everything, where the matter's conserved, right, locally. So um, I guess I'd say dislocation climb is, um, is inherently very, very energetic. Okay, thank you very much. And also uh, Anton says, uh, all clear, thank you. Yes, Anton says all clear. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so is there any other question from the audience? You can also mute yourself if you want. Oh, I see one. Uh, um, so um, uh, Maurit uh, Alms uh, asks, uh, would a similar theory be possible for point-like defects rather than half planes? So, so um, let me see if I understand the question, right? So I need to understand the question. So are you asking here, in this picture here, you're imagining that there's a whole half plane. This is the half plane you're talking about? Yes? I, I imagine so. I imagine so. Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, you're saying, can crystals have point defects all by themselves in 3D, mm -hmm. right? So 3D point defects in crystals are hard. I, I would... In real crystals, I would say that they're energetically, you know, outrageous. Mm. Smectics have them. Mm. I can refer you to some other work on smectics, um, but they're different. They're not. They're they're not. They're not ways of of creating motion. They are charges of a different kind. They're they're like the kind of charges that a hedgehog defect has instead of the kind of charge that an Abergosov vortex a vortex has or a superconducting a super fluid flux lattice has. So it's in a different class. One is talking about the fund of pi one, the other is talking about maps to pi two. And then Achille Mori asks, is there a relation with the method of inverse Higgs constraints? Yes, I, I think it's this it's the same thing. It's just a different language, right? And the 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 key thing the key thing to say about that, um, I'll just scribble up here on the top, is that um, in, this, in the pneumatic, you have this theta. This is the angle. This is the angle of the director. And when you go from the isotropic state to the pneumatic state, you end up having some energy grad theta squared, or energy density, because theta is a Goldstone mode, 
theta shifting theta by a constant costs no energy, right? And so um, you end up with a theory like this. K vanishes when you go into the isotropic state and was non-zero in the pneumatic state. The problem with crystals, and it's the same thing you said, and uh, 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 Lo and Manaharan uh, have written on this, right? Is that is that when you have the crystal, there are deformations of the lattice, which I'll just write as grad U, but the deformations of the lattice can couple to the rotations. And so you get something that kind of looks like the Higgs mechanism. And in fact, that's an essential point, right? It's an essential point. If you had a 3D, a 2D crystal, a 2D crystal starts as a 2D liquid. And a 2D liquid has three golds, three symmetries, two translations and a rotation. So it should have three goldstone modes by usual counting, but it doesn't, right? A 2D crystal only has two phonons. There's third goldstone mode, which is the rotations is massive. It's higged out, right? So people do talk about it that way. <laughs> what I think um, is very important though, is this connection, right? Or at least for us, or for, let's see, us. Us is too strong, for me, <laughs> okay? I'm not gonna speak for my collaborators, right? For me, the most important conception is, is that topological defects are motion in this ground state manifold. And the coordinates of the ground state manifold are the Goldstone modes. So if you're missing a Goldstone mode because of what you call the inverse Higgs mechanism, or which I'd call the inverse Higgs mechanism also, you have a bad, this is badly parameterized, right? So even though you have all these different ground states, and this is the manifold of ground states, it's very difficult to move around in here, mm. right? I already showed you that in general, right? If I wanna go from zero to pi, See, this isn't a closed loop. This disclination has dislocation component also. I can't make arbitrary disclinations. The disclinations have to sit here or here. Does that, does that help? Yes, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Okay, and there's another question. Uh, yes, the Corentan is uh, raising his hand. Please go ahead, Corentan. Yes. yes, thank you for your talk. Uh, so you said that if you, depending on the symmetry of the lattice, for instance, if you have a rectangular or square lattice, your defects yes. will look like a different spot. So yes. what would you expect will happen if you, uh, let's say you take a square lattice and you continuously strain it to turn it into a rectangular lattice? Yes, yes, exactly. Right. So, so we, 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 we are, we are equally bothered by that same question, right? Um, but what I'd say is that here you can see that the square lattice is allowed to have the same kinds of defects that the, that the other two can have, that the, you know, the rectangular lattice can have. So if you talk about phase disclinations of pi, then these work. So you can ask yourself, if you take a square lattice and you shear it, right? You, know, you do a simple shear, so now it's rectangular. What happens to those old geometric disclinations, right? Or, I mean, it's even, it would be even more pronounced on the triangular lattice, which you can, you can shear the triangular lattice and turn it into a rectangular lattice if you wanted to, right? So you have these five, seven disclinations and suddenly they're not allowed anymore. Because what happens is they, they make structures which look like they're okay, but they're called partial disclinations. So what happens is it breaks up into partial disclinations. And then, and then I'm at a loss to talk about the topology yet, but it's not something that we, it's something that we worry, that we've worried about and we don't have a nice answer. I'll tell you, we also don't have a nice answer. And it could be related to the question of what happens if the lattice has a basis? How do you get the basis vectors to all work together properly? Right, but you know, at the at the largest scale, this at least explains to us the piles and the borrow barrier, and at the same time tells you where the special defects can sit. But yes, I agree, I agree with the premise of your question. Uh, very good. Uh, I don't think there is any other question left. Uh, I'm checking the chat. No, it looks like there is not. So let me uh, thank uh, all the speakers again. And oh, we, there is one message. Oh, uh, Anton, no, you just said thank you. Anton says thank Randy. You're welcome. <laughs> so thank you very much to all the speakers of this session. Thanks again for reminding us how beautiful is topology, how connected are areas of physics that appear to be different from one another. 
And I would like to say goodbye to everybody. If you can, those of you who can, please stick around and enjoy the Veldoven uh, online conference. Thanks and bye-bye everybody. Thank you.